How about those JBQ, TBQ people? Wow, I'm, I'm amazed. I was visiting my brother-in-law's church in South Florida and the pastoral staff decided that they would do an exhibition where they would quiz against the JBQers. It was an absolute bloodbath. An absolute bloodbath. And my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law handled it so well. I mean, with such gentle humility and, and everything else. And I made a decision as I was watching that take place that night that never in this lifetime would I put myself in that position. Such humiliation. Those guys are absolutely amazing. And can you imagine memorizing every word of the book of Acts? And we're not talking about just, we're talking about quoting it. 992 verses. How many words? No. 992 verses in the book of Acts. Wow. Uh, they're, they're just amazing people. Well, I know for some of you, you're going to have to think back for a while, but remember the dating years? Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. For some folks, it's just, it's still a really sore subject. But do you remember the dating years? There's two or three out there that just kind of shook their head like, no, I have absolutely no recollection. How many of you were ever dumped? Okay. Yeah. Women are far more honest about these things. I didn't see a single guy's hand go up in the whole place. Uh, yeah, how many of you, how many of you, you know, dumped somebody? You remember? Uh, it's, I actually, um, I actually experienced both. Um, not on the same night, but I <laughs> actually, I've been there. Uh, so I've got some wisdom, and we've got a lot of young people here uh, this morning. We've got the crew back from camp and everything. And by the way, they had a great camp this week, but great to have you guys back. Here's just a word of advice. If you are going to dump somebody, don't do it over dinner. Here's a bad way to start the evening. You sit down in the restaurant, say, what would you like? Oh, by the way, I feel like this relationship is going nowhere. The rest of the dinner becomes very difficult. So you don't, you don't do that over, it's an awkward, it, and by the way, it, and you don't hang out for dessert either. I mean, it's like, phew. it's an awkward dinner. And it was an awkward dinner, possibly the most awkward dinner function in history. A meal ominously tagged in the Bible as the last supper. Have you ever stopped to consider what a tough night that was around the table? Maybe you've had some tough nights around the table. I doubt if there were anything like this. I'm sure you would remember it. The most awkward night ever. Jesus said to them, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, King James's mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You say, well, why was that so awkward? That, why was that night so awkward? Well, you have to get back into the context of what was happening the night of the Great Supper, or the Last Supper, I should say. The night started off off kilter when Jesus gird himself like a common servant and washed their feet. That didn't happen very often at all. And Peter objected. He said, this isn't right. This isn't fitting. And Jesus gently and firmly rebuked him. That's a tough way to start an evening at the table, isn't it? Everybody gathers together. Everybody's there. Everybody's ready. And it starts off with a rebuke. But sometimes awkward moments, well, they affect the whole evening. And the evening went from awkward to kind of ugly. It, quickly turned ugly when Jesus said, oh, and by the way, one of you is going to re b betray me. One of you is going to betray me. That's the kind of statement that makes you push your plate away and sit back to hear more. Now he's got your attention. And awkward becomes ugly and then absolutely awful because Judas, around the table, Judas was unmasked as the betrayer and he leaves the room in a rush. And Simon Peter, who's always jumping into the breach, Simon Peter jumps into the breach once again, bravely declaring that he would die for Christ, to which Jesus responds, 
before the morning comes, you'll have denied me three times. Would you agree that makes for an awkward dinner? the Last Supper. Maybe you've never considered it that way because we often read the Bible in kind of a linear fashion and we don't stop to walk in the context and say, I'm Joe Israelite and I just came to dinner with the guys who invited me to sit down in the evening and around the table these things happen. And if you really want to grasp the Bible and feel the Bible and sense the Bible, you have to walk in the Bible's context as best you can. You have to say, what would that have been like? to be seated around that table. And the evening wasn't over. Jesus takes it even a step further, but he says, oh, by the way, too, I'm going to be going away, and where I'm going, you can't follow now. Tough night. Troubling news. And this is really confusing for the, for the disciples. It's very disconcerting because on the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, Peter had said, see, Lord, all of us, see us. We have left all to follow you. And Jesus affirmed them by saying, truly I say to you in the new world when the Son of Man is sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Now the disciples, this is their context here. It's an immediate context. In their minds, we're going to Jerusalem and something dramatic is going to happen in Jerusalem by some miracle, by some political miracle Jesus is going to be recognized as Messiah. He's going to ascend to the throne, and he's already said that we have positions where we will be ruling with him. And they saw everything in that immediate context. They were waiting for the coronation. They arrive in Jerusalem. They have the triumphal entry. And remember at the triumphal entry, the people are singing messianic psalms. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us now, Lord. All of these are messianic psalms. For the Jews, this was the language that they used when they said, here's Messiah. And so he comes through the gate and everybody's celebrating and the disciples are going, this is awesome. And then they go to dinner. And at dinner, the wheels fall off their little coronation wagon. And in moments, their movement is dead and their hopes that accompanied that triumphal entry are dashed. This is more than a setback for these folks. The sky was falling. This was catastrophic. And every one of them is left with this question. What now? What does this mean? Where do we go? What do we do? How does the kingdom advance without the king? And in that moment at the table, 11 remaining disciples aren't thinking about the body of his teaching or the power of his parables or the wonder of his miracles. There is no, there is no past for them in that moment. In that moment, there is one thing that occupies their mind. You're leaving? Jesus, you're leaving us? You've marched us right into the lion's den here in Jerusalem and you're leaving us? And it's against that context that Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Troubled. It's an understatement, isn't it? Troubled. You got trouble? How many of you would say trouble right now is an understatement in my life? I got more than trouble. You talk about trouble. I've got trouble. They had trouble. Lots of trouble. I mean, Judas is gone. Peter will falter, Jesus said. Nothing looks very triumphant as they're sitting around the table there. And Jesus said he's leaving. Troubled? Greek root from which we get our English word trouble, the Greek idea is agitated like dropping, and I chose the picture like dropping a drop of water into a pool and it, everything that was so smooth and everything that was so steady is suddenly riled up, agitated. Agitated is a good, it's a good uh, word to use here. Uh, it's a really straight translation. Troubled? Jesus is saying, don't be agitated. Don't be stirred up. Don't let these things destroy your inner peace and calm. And trouble destroys our inner peace and calm, doesn't it? 
How many of you have ever got up and you've just had a great morning? I mean, the coffee's been just perfect and breakfast was great and you're happy and then the phone rings. Or then the kids wake up. Or then you remember something. But something, something happens and that moment, those moments of bliss are suddenly completely supplanted with this sense of trouble. Have you ever gone to bed at night and you've been just chewing something? You, got, you have got a, a pebble in your sandal and you just can't get rid of it and you have a great night's sleep and you wake up the next morning and you feel great. You pop out of bed and it's somewhere and while you're getting dressed. All of a sudden you remembered what it was that bothered you so much the night before and you're right back into it. And the same thoughts are going through your mind and the same tapes are playing in your mind and suddenly your spirit is agitated, troubled, the heart is the seat of desire and emotion, and it's there under agitation that life becomes a storm. And a lot of people just live there. Their waters are never still. Peace never comes. It's always rocking and it's always rolling. Let not your heart be troubled. When Jesus gathered his disciples around the table for the Last Supper, this was no great movement. They didn't have Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. They didn't have it all organized by precincts with captains who were going to help them change their, their culture and their world. They had absolutely nothing as far as infrastructure was concerned. They weren't organized. The disciples were, at best, they were country boys in the big city of Jerusalem. They were Galileans. Many of them were fishermen. They weren't cut out for this kind of thing. All of a sudden, Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of God, and he's been talking about a sea change, and he's been talking about rising to the throne and all of this grand stuff, and all of that is good because he was Jesus. But all of a sudden, Jesus says, I'm going, and I'm leaving this with you. That's trouble. They were suffering the death of their visions of Jesus rising to political power and ruling with him. What a disconcerting time this was, this whole night was. Mary comes in and anoints his feet with, remember her anointing of his feet? She says, and Jesus said of her, she has anointed my feet for burial. That's a tough way to start the evening. Burial. Jesus is leaving. It's disconcerting. It's confusing. It's frightening. How do you reckon this with everything else that Jesus said? It doesn't fit together. And I wonder, I wonder if you've ever been there with a storm just raging beneath the surface. Maybe you're good at, at pulling it off, that calm exterior. Maybe this morning you've come into this place and no one would ever imagine that there is an absolute tempest at work inside of you, an absolute distorm, uh, storm, a terrible disquiet, a sense that well, it's just not going to work. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, almost a desperation. Your alone moments are not placid. Your stomach is in knots. You can't fix it. The pills won't take the edge off. Listen to what Jesus said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. Three things I want to touch on this morning. This is the first. Believe. Believe in me. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, in these tumultuous days, this world is in such a storm. Our nation is in such turmoil. Believe. We're called to have faith regardless of what we see, regardless of what is going on in our world. And we can't, you can't pass a week now without somebody blowing up something someplace. You can't turn your television on without getting into the political intrigue. You can't, I mean, you just cannot find peace. If you're living on a steady diet of 24-hour news cable, I've got to tell you, you are probably not very much at peace because there's no peace to be found out there. You believe in God, believe, Jesus says, believe also in me. You say, that sounds like an easy way out. You're just saying, well, we just need to trust the Lord. That's exactly what I'm saying. We just need to trust the Lord. 
We've tried to fix it on our, with our own power and our own strength. We've tried to fix it through election. We've tried to fix it through political power. We've tried to fix it by exercising muscle anywhere we can exercise muscle. And the bottom line is this, we can't fix it. We've got to trust the Lord. Now, I'm not advising for a moment that anyone disengage from the whole political process. We are engaged in these things and we need to be faithful to these things. But understand this, our help comes from the Lord. And if first and foremost, we do not have absolute trust that he holds us in the palm of his hands, we will be shaken, we will be, we will be agitated. And when the world looks to us for calm, they won't find it. I think sometimes the world looks at the church and here's what they see. Ah! That was just to wake the three of you up. You know who you are. God bless you. God bless you. There are moments in life when nothing adds up. There are, are troubles that come that defy explanation. There are tears and fears and lonely places, disappointments and disenchantments and disillusionment. Don't think for a moment that you're alone in your trouble or that your trouble is special. I'm sorry, but it's not special. We always think that our trouble is special because our trouble is so personal and it hits us so deeply, but your trouble is the same old ordinary brand that people have been taking off the shelves for years. Regular old trouble, one remedy, trust. Everybody's got trouble. You've got to trust him. Don't think for a moment you've got some new super hyper developed strain of trouble people are sometimes proud of their trouble people become addicted to trouble you, have you ever met someone who's addicted to trouble it's all they ever talk about they can't they can't care you can't get three sentences into into a conversation before it, it all turns downhill it's because they've just they live on that adrenaline of everything's wrong and everything's broken and oh look what's happened to me and it's it's very self-centered but people get all caught up in this and all we hear about is trouble and they they would have you believe that it's it's special trouble it's ordinary it's regular I know I'm a killjoy this morning but it's the truth it's regular I was in the Dominican Republic 1992 one of our, our early teams that went out and did some uh, Book of Hope distribution. And uh, usually I do very well in foreign cultures, but I got sick. I mean, I got horribly sick. Don't know where I got it, don't know how I got it. You know, I've, I've tried to do, I've tried to figure, I couldn't, I was sick. It's miserable to be sick at home. It's more miserable to be sick when you're in another nation someplace and you don't have the comforts of our healthcare system and you don't know and you don't know what's wrong with you. And man, I was, I was so, so miserable. I was so sick. I had two fears and they flowed, one flowed right into the other. The first fear was I'm going to die. The second fear that flowed out of that was I'm not going to die. <laughs> I was so sick. <laughs> you ever been there? My, um, my roommate was my cousin, Rob Hoskins, and he had absolutely no sympathy whatsoever for me. None whatsoever for me. Rob, well, all I can say is, you know, God's grace is wonderful that it would cover Rob's sins against me. <laughs> he had just absolutely no sympathy for me. So I said, man, I am, Rob, you've got to get me a, you got to get me a doctor, to a doctor, get a doctor. And fortunately, someone in the church that we were helping there knew a doctor, and a female doctor came um, to see us. And so she came in, she did everything that a doctor would do, took my pulse and my temperature and all, all of that type of stuff and everything else. And man, I was, I was waiting for her. I, we had an interpreter there too. She spoke all Spanish. I didn't speak any Spanish. So we had the interpreter there. And and so everything's going through interpretation. I'm expecting the doctor to say, this man needs to be in a hospital. We need to take you to a hospital. And I'm thinking, you're going to airlift me is what you're going to do. <laughs> I'm not going to a Dominican hospital. But I didn't have to get there because she looked at me and she did this. And I knew I was in trouble when she did this. She went, <sighs> lousy bedside manner. She said, El gripe. I don't know Spanish very well, but I figured that out really quick. The grip, grip, the grip. Remember, my grandparents would talk about the grip. We call it the flu. What this, <laughs> this woman's telling me that I have the flu? 
This is not the flu. This is death, baby. I am suffering here. This is not the flu. Everything. She's out the door. That's all it was. Now, it was a very special strain for me because I didn't live in the Dominican Republic and they're all a little bit different no matter where. And it was, it was an awful thing to go through, but it was, it, was just, it was just the flu. And some of you think that you've got some special strain of, of trouble. And I say this, I hope it will be encouraging to you. I'm not saying it to try and discourage anyone, but what you're dealing with is common. All of the troubles that have come upon you, they're common. We're all grappling with these things. We're all dealing with these things. It's just plain old ordinary trouble, and he's the answer. He's the answer. There's help and there's strength for you because you're not going through anything that a hundred of us can't testify that, yeah, we walked through that, and the Lord brought us through on the other side, and we're going to make it. I prayed with a mother at the altar this morning, and my heart went out to her because I flashed back in my mind to two or three situations when we were raising our girls. When we were raising our girls, and I thought, in the midst of all of that, we felt like it was World War III. We thought that we were at the end of the line, and look at what God did. It's ordinary trouble. It's not special. Oh, and by the way, I just feel like I need to share this. My cousin, Rob. Yeah, I got, I got well. Thank the Lord. I was good in a couple days. And on the third day, which was just the day before we got the plane to come home, he got up in the morning, he turned to me and says, Man, Dave, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I am so sick, I feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> and I tried to contain it, but within my spirit there was this, yes! 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 And I pray the Lord will forgive me too. Trouble? Trouble just raises this agitation and this urgency this urgency in us, and we feel like, got to fix it, got to fix it, God's got to fix it, something's got to happen, it's got to happen right now, and we, we don't know that we can endure, I can't go any bit, oh God, you've just got to come on this, please just come on the scene now. There was a ruler named Jairus, remember? He was the ruler of the synagogue, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, my daughter, my daughter is dying, you've got to come now, and Jesus graciously says, I'll come with you. And they go down the road a little bit. They're on their way. He's, Jesus coming to the rescue. And a woman, the Bible says she was a woman with the issue of blood, or the woman with this blood disorder, this bleeding issue, reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, and he stops. And I can just see Jairus going, no, 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 not now. Not now. But Jesus has time for, who touched me? And he has time for interaction with this woman. And I can imagine in Jairus' heart, he's thinking, we've got to go, we've got to go, we've got to go. She's not going to make it. And his fears were not misplaced because the scripture says, while he was still, while Jesus is still speaking to the woman, while he was still speaking, some came and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Is there any place quite so certain, quite so final as that moment of death? There are moments in life where nothing adds up, where troubles come that defy our explanation, where tears and fears dominate our hearts. In these moments, we find we have nothing but faith. And faith is more than enough. By the way, Jesus turns to Jairus when Jairus hears the message about his daughter is dead and Jesus doesn't need to come anymore. Notice what he said. He said, um, do not be afraid. Only believe. Believe in God. Believe also in me. It was a common theme for Jesus. Have Faith. He offered no explanation. He revealed nothing at all. He just said, only believe. See, Jairus had nothing to hold on to but faith. But when the sun was setting that evening, he was holding his daughter in his arms, alive. I say to you, no matter the trouble, no matter the fear, no matter the wind or waves or darkened skies, believe. Have faith even when you have no answers. Have faith when you don't have what you want. Have faith when it seems that all is lost, have faith when you hurt or when you are hindered, have faith when everything is being shaken. Have faith, believe, 
See, at the Last Supper, the disciples couldn't imagine what was about to take place. They had no context. They couldn't put it together. They couldn't get their arms around it. They couldn't fathom that they were about to observe the greatest moment in all of history, the greatest demonstration of love at Calvary, the greatest demonstration of power in the resurrection of Jesus. They couldn't imagine that in 50 days, the Holy Spirit, that in all of their Christian, or all, I should say in all of their Jewish education, they had understood that the Holy Spirit comes at times to empower like the prophets or to work miracles in, through people in that time. They could not put it together that the Spirit was going to fall on them all and that God was going to raise them up as a movement that would change the whole world. They couldn't understand the things that were yet to come. They were left with faith alone. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, we are left with faith alone. Is it enough for you? It must be. It has to be. But Jesus went further. He answered their fear of displacement and being alone with a promise of belonging. You see, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms, slash rooms. They argue about the interpretation of the, of the Greek word. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare, these words are powerful, a place for you. Listen, God has already prepared a place for you. This is God saying, you belong to me. I have a place for you. I'm going away, but I'm not abandoning you. There is a place for you. No greater peace than knowing at the end of a, of a journey that you are expected, that you are expected. Had a nightmare once. I showed up for a cruise. That wasn't the nightmare. That was a good part. But when I showed up for the cruise, they had no reservation in my name. What a bummer. I don't know about you, but I show up. I expect that they've got a place for me. Have you been through the tension of being standby on a flight before? Have you ever been bumped? Oh, wait a minute. I paid for the ticket, and you said you had a place for me. They're asking for people who, who will take a voucher to go later, who will change this, who will change that. I'm sitting there doing the calculations, but I'm thinking, what's wrong with you boys? When people pay down, when people put down the money, when people have bought the ticket, there should be a place for them. Listen to me. When God called you, when he made you, he already has ordered there is a place for you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. To everyone who calls upon the Lord, the Bible says they will be saved. God has a place for them. You have an eternal destiny that's established in the heavens. Is there an amen in the house this morning? I can just say it myself because it echoes a bit in the room. It sounds like a big crowd when I say it. No, and I, when I travel, I love to come home because that's where I belong. I've traveled all over and I've done a lot of things and, and I've been blessed to, to go to a lot of places. But I'll tell you, the older I get, the more I love to come home. When you've been gone for a while, I've got to tell you, you land and, and uh, you get in the car and you drive down your street and you open that door and when you step into your space, there is something about it that just says, oh, I am so glad to be home. That's what heaven's going to be like because he's prepared a place for you, a place where you belong. Jesus came into this world without reservations. The Bible says there's no room for him at the end. None whatsoever. And so it seems to me he has determined that you and I will never know such uncertainty. And when he said, I, I go to prepare a place for you, I believe he just wanted to answer that sense of insecurity for everyone who would ever call upon his name. There is a place for you. You are expected. You are expected. You are expected. When I came to Jesus, I found my place in this world and also in the world to come. I have no fear of being alone or being lost or being cast away. I am expected one day. I am expected entering into his eternal presence. And so I know that he will preserve me in the present. The disciples, you see, they thought they were seeing the end of their grand dream and experiment, and Jesus let them know in no uncertain terms, I'm preparing a place for you in my Father's house. This life is not a destination, it's a journey. 
It must be weighed and considered not in the light of our temporary achievements, but eternal purposes. And so if in, in this life we have trouble, well, the Bible said that we would even know persecution. If we have trouble, we need to take comfort in the fact that there's a place for us. And finally, there is, there is a sure future that God has for all of us, and he calls us to be ready. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. All of the Scripture tells us Jesus is coming. Now, no one knows the day or the hour, and we've really made a hash of interpreting the signs of the times through the years. We should stop doing that. Even if you know, it doesn't make that much difference. You say, well, if I know, I'd really be telling people. Stop and examine that statement for a moment. I mean, just work a little bit of logic here. We don't know. We're supposed to be ready. We're supposed to be ready. But every once in a while, somebody gets everyone stirred up by throwing a date out there, and they list together, you know, something that they put together and doing, you know, a little bit of math with the Jewish calendar, and they throw in a few traditions through the years, and then something that happened in planetary alignments. And when they put the whole thing together, they say, when you add all of that up, it means the 21st of May. And everyone goes, God help us. And he will. God help us. We've only got 12 days. And we get all excited. Harold Camping, five years ago, an obscure Bible teacher, set dates on, on a number of occasions for the return of the Lord. He'd, he'd set a date, by the way, in 1988, and he missed that one. That's the same year someone else set a date. Wisenut, I think, was his name. 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 1988. He missed it, so he put out a second book, 89 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in, in 1989. He did. He honestly did. You can't make this stuff up. I don't think in 1990 he put out a book. Harold Camping, though, had several dates that he missed. He missed 1988. He missed another date that he said in 1984 Jesus didn't come. But he did a bunch of recalculations, and he came up with, he came up with two dates uh, back in, in um, 2011, two dates. I mean, he had them, had them nailed down. One was in May, I think, and one in September if, or October, if I, got those, if I got them right. But one date was going to be the rapture of the church. The second date was going to be the judgment. And he was a radio preacher, and people sent him money. They sent him a lot of money. They sent him $200 million. Which has me just scratching my head. And, but the, the logic was this, we'll send him money and he'll do a big campaign where he announces Jesus is coming on such and such a date and it'll scare people and they'll repent and more people will be in the kingdom of God. That's the, only, that's the only pure motivation that I can see in the midst of all of it. And I just have to say, scaring people into the kingdom of God has never been a winning strategy. He'll have you by love or not at all. But anyways, it was, it was out there, and they spent more than $100 million were spent on billboards alone promoting the date, the dates. And then the dates were reset once more time, one more time, and then Harold kind of withdrew from the stage and, and sadly died a, a couple of years later. Well, I think camping might have accomplished something in his flawed and failed campaigns and that he at least raise the question that we Christians should be asking ourselves, do we really believe Jesus is coming back and do we live as though he is? Do we live as though he is? Do you really believe it? And if you want to live without your heart being troubled, if you want to know what it is to have peace, you have to grapple with this. Do I really believe Jesus is coming back again? As a culture, there was a time in America as a culture when the, the preponderance of the churches believed and looked for the coming of the Lord. This theology was shot through even our culture. Those days are no more. And even in churches, 
you'll find that people don't talk much about Jesus coming in clouds of glory. They feel like we need to help people and counsel people through more of the traumas of life. Listen, brother, you can make it through the traumas of life. You can get through hell on earth if you understand that there is a place that is prepared for you and there is a promise that is awaiting and you may see that promise before you die. Him coming in clouds of glory. We need this. You see, if Jesus isn't coming back, then he lied to those men in the upper room, and you can't trust a lying Savior. If he isn't coming again, then we are left with this question, why did he come in the first place? And if he isn't coming, then every New Testament writer, every last one of them is guilty of fraud. Paul himself wrote to the Corinthians, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Most pitiable. God's work in and with this world is an unfinished work. We are supposed to preach the gospel to every nation and then the end will come, the scripture says. We are to tell everyone of the Christ who died for them. We are to walk in the light and watch and watch for his appearing. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, who were wondering about Jesus coming back again. They were doubting that Jesus was coming back again and wondering what would happen to those who died if they died before he came in clouds of glory. They were really concerned about all of these things. And so Paul wrote, he wrote to them, and in the fourth chapter of First Thessalonians, familiar words, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we will always be with the Lord. Paul says, therefore comfort one another with these words. You got trouble, you need comfort. Where do you find comfort? You find comfort by believing first of all believing that God is who he says he is, that Christ is indeed the Savior of the world, you need to understand and believe without wavering for even a moment that he has a place for you, that he has a place of belonging for you, and that he is coming again for you. Basic theology that has been roundly abandoned. Peter closes his first epistle with a, refuge, uh, with, with a reference to the appearing of Christ, the chief shepherd, his appearing. In the second epistle, Peter says, scoffers will come saying, where's the promises of, of his coming? He goes on to say, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. James says, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord draws nigh. Seeing that this life is not all there is, and that Jesus' coming is near, seeing that he has prepared an eternal place for us and we are not forgotten, seeing that faith is an overcoming force, will we let trouble agitate our souls? Let not your heart be troubled. Have faith, that's believe. Hold fast, you belong. Hold on. He's coming. He's coming. I grew up in I grew up in the midst of books. My mom was a voracious reader. My dad also, but especially my mom. I remember it was a big day at our house when the first order, this, you used to get them by, you, you could buy them by volumes, but the Encyclopedia Britannica <laughs> came. That was an amazing thing. I remember as those books came one after the other, and they were assembled on the shelf up in our family room. I remember thinking, wow, we got the knowledge of the whole world. Now you got that on your cell phone right there in your seat. Have, have any encyclopedia salesmen been by your house lately? But it was a different day. It was a different age. And my mom was convinced that we needed to know everything that there was to know or anything that we should know, and then you could find it in books. So our house was populated by books. I know that I was a boy less than 15, probably 12 or so, because I remember the house, I remember the coffee table, so I can date where I was at that particular time. When I saw a book on Mom's Table by Malcolm Muggridge, Muggridge was an, ag an atheist turned agnostic who encountered Christ, who became a Christian apologist. 
uh, late, late, late in life. Yeah, I think he was in his 70s when he found Christ. Muggeridge was brilliant. One of those stunning intellects that come along once in a generation. He was like a Chester tenor. Um, the kind of mind like Ravi Zacharias. Just an incredible, incredible man. Mom introduced me to Malcolm Muggeridge. And somewhere around 13, I can remember opening that book, sitting on the coffee table at our house and starting to read Malcolm Muggeridge. And I couldn't understand everything that he was shooting for, but nobody could turn a phrase like that guy. And I was somewhat enthralled. Well, I got on with life and went off to school and Bible college and got married. And somebody one day gave me a book by Ravi Zacharias, Can Man Live Without God? If, you've, if you're going to read Ravi Zacharias, read that one. Don't miss that one. And I'm reading Ravi's book and absolutely loving every minute of it. And I'm seeing quote after quote after quote after quote by Malcolm Muggeridge. And something trips in my mind. Like, I remember my mom was reading him. So I started buying Muggeridge. Books would come in the mail. Some of them were used books, torn up, chipped up. But I started reading Muggeridge. And I found such a resource there. He says, so often he says what I want in my heart to say, but I'm limited. But I wish somehow I could communicate, and so I'll let him close the teaching this morning. Malcolm Muggeridge wrote, the world's way of responding to the signs of decay is to engage equally in idiot hopes or idiot despair. On one hand, some new policy or discovery is confidently expected to put everything to rights, a new fuel, a new drug, detente, world government. On the other hand, some disaster is confidently expected to prove our undoing. Capitalism will break down, fuel will run out, plutonium will lay us low, atomic waste will kill us off, overpopulation will suffocate us, or alternatively, a declining birth rate will put us more surely at the mercy of our enemies. In Christian terms, such hopes and fears are equally beside the point. As Christians, we know in this world we have no continuing city that crowns roll in the dust and that every earthly kingdom must sometime flounder. We acknowledge a king men did not crown and cannot dethrone, and we are citizens of a city of God they did not build and they cannot destroy. Don't be afraid. You say, but it's, don't be afraid. You say, but we've got to fix it. We can't fix it. Don't be afraid. Father, I just pray for those who are living with troubled waters right now, great agitation in life. I pray, Lord, that you would give them peace that they would return to the roots of their faith whereby we believe in you, we trust in you, we listen to your word and we take it to heart. We know who we are, we find our identity and our sense of belonging in you and we look for you to return in clouds of glory. Oh Lord, if we are criticized for being people with a plan of escape and somehow trying to put our head in the sand, we are not putting our head in the sand. We are lifting our eyes to the heavens where you promised, O oh Lord, you promised us your soon return. And so we anticipate you. We anticipate you. We cry out, even so, come Lord Jesus. Would you stand with me? If you'd wait with me for one moment if our elders and deacons would come and join me here at the front, please. And if you come to this place this morning and you're grappling with either an insecurity about your own soul or just fear, stuff you're going through, maybe you're walking through deep waters right now and you're in trouble. We don't want you to leave this place until had the opportunity to pray with you and ask the Lord to help you. And so we're just going to sing the chorus 
one more time. And as we sing, I want to invite you to come. And when we're done with the chorus, then we'll, we're dismissed from this place. But I want to pray God's blessing on you first. Father, I pray your blessing. I pray your guidance. I pray your hope and your help and your healing in the lives of people who so desperately need you. We desperately need you. Use us for your grace, for your power, for your honor and glory in this community. As we walk with you, O oh Lord, may we be people who are not troubled and do not fear. We put our confidence and our trust in you. It's in you. Let's sing that chorus one more time and we'll be dismissed.